Thank you very much. And now, you know, as last time we spoke about the mind, you know, creating all the characteristics of this universe, including ourselves as humans, let me give you a brief structural description how this mind operates. So all people who like systems, open your ears. Those people who don't like system, only human beings, also open your ears. Because the way it operates is so simple and so clear that if you just look inside and you observe, you get it. It's not difficult, okay? So we begin with what we can sense and observe, and that's the five physical senses. It's the easiest, okay? So we have eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body. This is touch, okay? So we can touch, we can hear, we can see, we can smell, and we can taste. All these result in hearing consciousness, seeing consciousness, tasting consciousness, touching consciousness, okay? And these five are actually pretty clear. And as you look at literature and art, when the sixth, the sixth sense comes, then it becomes very interesting and very mystical. Again, the Orient had never professed any mystery about the sixth. They considered thinking our thought almost a physical sense because you sense names with your brain. Some name appears in your consciousness, Dharma talk. And it's, oh, almost three o'clock, go up, okay? So the sixth consciousness is the name sensor and the name creator. So all the conceptual work is done in your sixth consciousness, which we call thinking, conceptual thinking, okay? In Sanskrit, it's called Vijnana. The Sanskrit name doesn't help you, but for distinctions, it's really good. Okay. What it does is it creates concepts, relates concepts, makes systems out of concepts. So that's your CPU in the computer. That's your central processing unit. It's the biggest chip. <laughs> it's your brain. Okay. And it's a very important point that it moves around the names. It puts the names onto phenomena. Without thinking, you wouldn't be able to say, ah, this is a microphone. Because you see it, then as we go on with this lecture, you will see that it has some stored information. I've seen this microphone before, or similar things, and we used to call it microphone, so this time I also call it microphone. This is a very fast process, very quick. So we address things. We put labels on things with this sixth consciousness. Also, we analyze them. So all the logical conclusions and all philosophy and everything is created with this thinking. And if you die, then you lose the five senses plus the sixth, which is the brain, and you cannot consciously think. Okay? That's a very important. So then, the seventh consciousness is what we call manas, is the dualism maker. What does that do? As you see something, anything comes in through the five plus one senses, this consciousness addresses it, good or bad. I like it, I don't like it. It's me or not me. Okay? The most basic, the basic distinction, is this me or not me? So usually when they say somebody else, when, when we see somebody else, okay, that's Clara and not me. It's so stupidly simple that we don't even make it conscious. Or when we see a building, we say, that's a building and not me. And at the level of phenomena, it's all true. But if you observe the first talk today, then you have a notion that all beings and all phenomena substance is one substance. So if you look at the level of name and form, everything and everybody is different. But if you look at beyond name, beyond form, then this Buddha nature of all beings and all phenomena is the same. 
So this is why this teaching of no thinking is so important because as long as you keep your opposites machine going, you can never go beyond name and form because you constantly address them, label them, analyze them, make opposites, okay? And as long as you're attached to the sixth, the seventh, and of course later the eighth, you cannot attain enlightenment. So when we say don't think, it doesn't mean blow your brain into pieces. Everybody already understands that. It means just attain one moment <coughs> of no thinking. And then the movement of the sixth stops. The movement of the seventh, which splits the world into many, many pairs of opposites, also stops. And what else needs to stop? Naturally, the fuel. What kind of fuel does this need, does this kind of process need? We call that memory. So the eighth is the Alaya Vijnana, is the big storehouse. And this huge storehouse contains all the sensory information and all the data from the sixth and the seventh. It's all stored in the eighth. Have you ever had a deja vu? I guess so. So that means your eighth consciousness talked to you. I've seen this before. Okay? And deja vu is very interesting because it seems like an isolated thing. In fact, we constantly have a deja vu. Why? Because whoever you didn't finish your karma with from your past is here. Whatever business you didn't terminate because you didn't complete is still your job. So you constantly revisit your past karma in this moment. Many, many people ask, Sunim, how can I get back to my past life? I said, why do you want to get back there? Oh, it would be so interesting to find out what I did, what I was. And then I say, look, whoever you had some business with, they're still here. Whatever you know, phenomena are important for you, they are still around you. Whatever, you know, leftover you have, whatever indebtedness you have towards this world, you are still doing it, okay? So don't look in the past for the true origin. It's not there. It's right in this moment. Because you still carry your karma with you. And all this karma is stored in the eighth consciousness or alaya vijnana, and uh, kind of tuned or distinguished, sometimes even discriminated by the seventh, or polarized, better say, by the seventh. And then it gets all combined by the sixth, and the five sensory you know, perceptions, the five senses are the gateways. Okay, the gateways or the ports, where these data go in, and go out. So the whole system, we say human being, is actually very, very simple. None of this is your true self. None of this is your Buddha nature. What is it then which we can call Buddha nature? Again, we know Buddha nature is a name and originally does not exist as a name or a form. What is really, really interesting that as you hear this, all your eight levels of consciousnesses, all the eight, they function. Not only that, there is something which observes this. Something which perceives memory. Something, something which perceives distinction. Something which perceives thinking. Something which says sight, smell, taste, touch, object of mind. Okay? So we call this clear mirror consciousness or Buddha nature or mind beyond life and death. There are many names to it, but originally no name, no form. Okay? So if you like, you can call it the ninth, but it sounds a little strange. Let's say it has no number. But anything which appears in your mind, anything from the eight levels is reflected by this. That's what makes us human. 
if we didn't have that, we would not be different from animal. Even having that, sometimes we are not different that much from animal. Okay? Because we don't use it. If we don't use our Buddha nature, how can we have compassion? If we don't use our Buddha nature, how can we have clear insight into cause and effect? How can we really perceive the world as it is if we don't use our basic human faculty of clarity and insight? Okay? Since we have this faculty, we can get enlightenment. We can save all beings. That's our major human characteristics, which makes us different from the rest of the ten, actually the six realms, the six suffering realms. Okay? This is a very important point. That's why the Buddha said, only if you are born in human body, then you can get enlightenment. Above, too good. Below, too bad. Okay? So animals, you see them, you know, they remember. Animals also remember, so they have the eighth. Also discriminate. So some dogs don't eat even the best food that you think of as good food for them. Some dogs and cats, very picky. You spoil them, they become so picky, like a spoiled and naughty child. Okay? Okay? So animals, they all have the one, two, three, four, five, six, all the eight that we talk about, but they cannot reflect. So if you cannot reflect, then you cannot change your karma. Okay? If you cannot change your karma, then you are just a robot or almost like an animal. If you look at human beings in these terms, how much we reflect and how much we actually change our karma, our common output as 6.3 billion humans is not so good. We could really improve that. How can we say not so good. We just said, don't make opposites. It's very clear. If you look at the amount of suffering that we create, that's the output. If you ask human beings, do you want to suffer? No, I don't want to. So why are we doing this? Answer, we do not see what we are doing. It's as simple and brutally simple as that. If we saw what we were doing as a group, Again, 6.3 billion humans. Don't think of smaller than that, okay? Just common. Common group karma as human beings. We would act differently. Because nobody wants to suffer. But why do we do that? Because of this major blindness or avidya, not seeing, as the Buddha called it. That's the root of our ignorance. This ignorance believes that the world has opposites built in, and based on that, we make desire or anger. So this machine of suffering starts. We make it. We operate it. We drink the bitter juice of it, okay? But we don't seem to be able to stop it. For one reason, and one reason only. We do not see what we are. We do not see what this world is. And we do not really see cause and effect. Instead, we follow our own ideas. And as long as we do that, we keep suffering. Okay? So if you observe how the eight levels of consciousness work, then you can change your karma. Because you, can, you do not have to follow your past, the eighth consciousness. You do not have to follow your judgments, your distinctions seven. You do not have to follow your smart thinking, the, all the combinations, the brilliant intellectual conclusions, okay? The six. And of course, you do not have to follow all the sensory perceptions that come in, reflect them, and decide what you want to do. This decide what you want, what kind of human direction you take, that's our major and major capability, okay? If you don't do that, then as humans, we can make our life, lives, much, much worse on this planet. Okay? Any questions about that? You mentioned save all beings, and I heard it from uh, several monks already. Uh, can you explain exactly what you mean by this? You. How do you save me? Are you suffering? Yes. Why? 
from all the reasons you mentioned before. Wrong. <laughs> you <laughs> suffer because of you. Okay? So, one question. What are you? I don't know. Already saved, if you keep this don't know mind. So, if you say, I really don't know who I am, that's a fair and honest statement. So, if you don't know this I, then take away this I, just keep don't know. In fact, keep this question, what am I? Who is already a presupposition that there is a person? So, who we don't really use. What is actually correct? So, in, in Korean, when you use your huadu, they say, Ige mo shinga. This, what is this? Okay? This substance, this being, this mind, what is this? And when you put that into your tantian and just observe that, it acts, again, like in physics, the black hole. It, it just absorbs everything. You don't have to suppress your thinking. You don't have to suppress your emotion. You don't have to do anything special. Keep this question, which cannot be answered by thinking. And if you keep that question, it absorbs and literally swallows all your ignorance, anger, and desire. Then your mind becomes very clear. That's the function of don't know. That's why we ask, what are you? You look inside, wow, don't know. I'm not my body, this body comes and goes. But what observes this body doesn't come or go. I'm not my emotions because emotions come and go. But what observes emotions doesn't come, doesn't. and you can play this with a lot of things in your mind. Everything in your mind. I'm not something which appears or disappears because otherwise I could not observe what appears and disappears. I hope logically this is clear to everybody. It's a fundamental point, not just in Mahayana, but also in Zen. If we did not have this clear mirror consciousness, we could not observe things as they come and go. We would go with them. We would identify with them. Okay? And we do not have to. We have an option not to. That's the option of liberation. Liberation. Okay? So if you keep don't know mind, that means all your attachments will stop. All your false identifications will stop. Then, naturally, you return to your true self. You don't have to do anything special. Return to your true self. And then, become free. Realize, originally, always free. No problem. No suffering. Unless you make problem, or you make suffering. So by keeping down no mind, you just return to this clear and unobstructed self this non-existing self, okay? Digest the words, your non-existing self. For the mind, it's like a big contradiction. How is it that I don't exist, you know? If you say you exist, mistake. If you say you, you do not exist, also mistake. That's all thinking, okay? So it's return to don't know, return to this moment, and then the suffering caused by your dualistic thinking, all finished. Okay? More question? Yeah? Mm, I'm reading this Sanyan Achimpan, The Compass of Zen. The Compass of Zen. And Sung San Sanyam says, uh, true meditation is not moving mind, mm -hmm. and I'm uh, confused. With, um, is it not emotion like Having no emotion, you s uh, you said before that if somebody's sad, I am sad. If somebody's sad, I am sad. Yeah. And and the, the not moving mind, I can't. It confuses me. Uh, not moving mind doesn't mean that you are missing anything or you are lacking anything. That's one. Two, what it really means is that you're not attached to anything coming and going. And if you can do that, then you can follow correct situation, relationship, and function. So when it's time to have emotions, you have emotions. When it's time to get rid of emotions, you do that. Moment to moment, keep clear. Moment to moment, help all beings. That means if thinking necessary, whoa, thinking appears. When it's not necessary, don't think just to yourself. Sometimes you see people who are walking alone in the street and they keep talking. They, they talk to themselves. Okay? 
that's a little bit, we say, crazy. But so many people do that, that it becomes like a natural social phenomenon. Do you see animals just talking to themselves? Dogs are barking to themselves, or birds are just chip, 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 and there's nothing and nobody around. No, they all respond to something, either to the time or nature or other animals. So if you are attached to emotion, then you're caught by your emotion. If you're attached to no emotion, that means you become like a flat line, total flat line, also a mistake. So return before emotion, return before thinking. Then when your mind mirror becomes clear, you see very clearly, emotion necessary or not. Then when it's necessary, have them. When not necessary, don't have them. I tell you an example. We had Hengja training exactly 10 years ago in Hainza. And our teachers, our monk teachers, were super. I was really fortunate to, to go there. And uh, of course, with that us, you know, Hengjas, all in brown clothing, they were tough, but also compassionate. Disciplined, but not too tight. And once, there was a little kid who just strayed off from mother. Korean boys are really vacuous, you know, you know that. So he was like seven, six, seven. And we had a kind of restricted area, which is just separated by some thatch fence. And the little kid found a door on it. It was not so easy to find, but he was pushing against it, found and just ran up to our porch. And we are sitting in there in the afternoon, listening to the actual you know, lecture or Dharma talk. And the little kid appears on our porch, stomping with his little feet. So uh, one of our monk teachers went out there, and they, they met right next to me. The door was open. And suddenly, that monk became the most compassionate, fatherly figure I have ever seen. You know, had the little kid, looked into his eyes, gave him a little pat on his shoulder. Where is your mom? How are you? Can I help you with something? Very natural. And I saw that and I said, wow, that's the tradition. That's correct tradition, okay? So when necessary, have emotions. This little kid required very different relationship, okay? So he had that, 100%. Then looked over the fence, mom, then meet, hand over the little boy, that's it. Then return, become 100% instructor. Then, as I heard, they went back, teachers into their room, they became friends total friends, teacher to teacher, monk to monk, okay? So that's how you can use your emotion. And I'm sure that when it was time to rest and everybody was alone in their room, they just switched off everything, sleep. We did, the hangers definitely did. Nine o'clock, three times chukpi, ta, 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 everybody sleep. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for your attention.